All right. Uh, yeah. Hello and welcome everyone uh, to the final session of the UCL InfoSec uh, seminar. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Michael Wiel, who is a lecturer at the Digital Rights and Regulations uh, at the UCL Faculty of Laws. And his research involves a mix of law, policy, emerging technologies, and human computer interaction. And he publishes both across law and computer science. And today, Michael will tell us about uh, some of his latest work on the use and potential abuse of privacy preserving infrastructure. And I'm really very much looking forward to the talk. So Michael, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Philip. So I wanted to um, uh, give a bit of a presentation that, that runs off some themes that I've been researching recently, but I've also rejigged it also for things that have happened even this week to, to form a bit of a bridge between uh, the, the community that I think I'm largely talking to. I know there's actually an interdisciplinary group here um, uh, and, and some of the law and policy concerns, um, particularly around uh, the use of privacy enhancing technologies. Usually when I give this talk, I have to explain a little bit to policy communities about what they are and I'm going to skip those bits entirely and not do that obviously that will be patronizing um but uh yeah, yeah hopefully that will be okay for everyone just to, hard to you know, get your audience uh right so i in in the kind of broad i think the appeal of of pets uh narratively as we see them these days is you know, data has been flowing everywhere and it's actually been accumulated in ways that are a bit out of control um, but we think there's a societal benefit to be had from analyzing it. And so pets are very much pitched as the have your cake and eat it approach. Uh, and, and we don't really ask necessarily who pets are, are uh, run by or uh, in, in whose interest they're run. Um, but they're definitely pitched as an array of technology. And a lot of the motivations that we see for research, uh, I think, are, are driven by this have your cake and eat it approach. And I like that. And I've been doing some of that work, a very small amount. Uh, uh, being involved in that as well. And I think there's lots of promise there. Um, but this whole future where our, our, our digital world is um, intermediated by privacy enhancing technologies in perhaps a more just way uh, is something that we're, we're also seeing platforms get really interested in. And we see that uh, a platform such as Facebook have, uh, have uh, been investing heavily in in, uh, in UCL, but also in, uh, in, in broadly in uh, in across these technologies you see job adverts all the time uh, for for uh, privacy preserving machine learning or privacy preserving systems or analysis and edge computing jobs from not just facebook but many large platforms and initially we might think that's a really good thing it's getting industry traction and you know to some extent that's correct it's getting interest of of uh, big powerful players and funders and that's the stage that, that research transitions through all the time and there certainly are some good things there but uh, good plans, typically, when they involve platforms as well, can go awry. And uh, this talk is a bit about the ways in which uh, privacy enhancing technologies might uh, might really come and bite us if we're not careful. And thinking about some principles for technology design and also uh, analyzing some of the uh, legal context around this to uh, ensure that privacy enhancing technologies uh, work for for society as well as um, and, and don't get caught narrowly in, in promoting certain interests and are configured in ways which I, I think are are, um, are hopefully uh, uh, in everyone's benefit. So that's what I want to talk about today, and that's the theme of this uh, this talk. So to understand why, um, uh, you know, firstly, before we even go and why platforms might be a problem and why we we might think they cause harm, it's worth adding some analytical precision to what platforms are. Uh, we sometimes talk about them, you know, we know it when we see it, a platform, uh, but let's think a bit about the logic of a platform. One way to define platforms that I quite like is uh, to look at what they do um, and, and to, to define them by their behaviors because they're broad and they, they span lots of different services and different approaches and, and different ways of intermediating uh, uh, things in online environments. Effectively, this is following Julie Cohen at Georgetown University, uh, they engage in intermediation that provides would-be counterparties, so we think it could be an advertiser and uh, an end user, with access to one another, and they provide techniques for rendering those users legible to those who seek to market goods and services to them. So they've got this dual role of access and legibility. 
access being they are the intermediate bottleneck point and they can decide and, and, uh, and technically facilitate that access. They can facilitate the delivering of adverts. They can facilitate the, uh, the uh, you know, a PR campaign or they can provide information about certain demographics the other way around. Um, and they also have to render those users legible. By legible, we're talking about machine readable. We're talking about machine readable at scale uh, and their activities becoming uh, effectively passable by, by computers and by individuals who are then you know, interacting with those computers. You know, that's as simple as that. So we can ask for show me people who are like these people or show me uh, people who meet these characteristics or give me information on these people. That's all legibility strategies. And these definitions are deliberately broad because there are actually many ways to render people legible, different groups legible. Uh, and and you know, again, it's we know it when we see it, uh, if they manage to render things legible in a way that's, it's, that's useful, we can, we can identify it as such. So what we, that's one way I think to understand platforms. And then this is just a non-complete list. I really hammered this out quite quickly, so it's not meant to be a, a neat framework. But we might look at some of the harms that, re that, that relate to platforms or concern them. Um, we can see them as a, as a conduit for, for harms, which th these are actions that aren't always harmful, uh, but, but some people see them as harmful by large actors like states. So we can look at uh, PRISM and the Snowden revelations where platforms and similar were deputized and still are deputized to provide large amounts of data to aid surveillance regimes. And we can look at uh, the role of, of states in using platforms to regulate speech and free expression. These are seeing your platforms as a conduit to use their access and legibility by large actors in ways that we might consider more or less legitimate depending on, on the situation. We could also see them as generating intrinsic harms. Um, and again, these are broad brush uh, ways of talking about it. it. Platforms, we often talk about them as market, you know, Facebook marketplace or eBay or Amazon marketplaces, but these aren't real markets as we know them typically. Advertising markets control both sides. They control what one side sees about the other. And so we can't, haven't got the metaphor of a walking around a marketplace and finding people to transact with, seeing, oh, have they got a better price or have they got a better price over here? Because markets, when they intermediate this, decide what which people in the marketplace you can see and how you how you look at them, and that can come with con, uh, concerns about information flows, competition concerns that we see through antitrust movements right now, in the U.S., Australia, U.K., and elsewhere. We also might be worried about these big actors being able to to facilitate manipulation, micro targeting, autonomy, uh, restrict autonomy, both for consumers and gig workers. We might find that they organize information in a problematic way, so they display aspects of our society in ways we wouldn't want. They mean that you know, they're not there, they're stifling female scientists, or they're stifling certain points of view, or they're, they're producing systems which have racist or sexist tendencies, for example. Um, we also might be worried that they, they, they damage our ability to be, say, creative and innovative with software and hardware, they, they're enclosing software so we can't run anything we like using sensors and, 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 and software. Um, uh, and, and so there might be intrinsic problems there. And lastly, another just potential harm is they become these arbitrary gatekeepers of information about society. So we saw this during COVID, Google providing mobility data, you know, who's moving where and which areas, but they could have e easily chosen not to provide that data and we, they could have provided different data instead. And we see them as these gatekeepers for information about society that they might be problematic. So these are a range of areas which we might be concerned around platforms. So we're just with that sort of set up, I, wanted, I want to emphasize that, that Having data in the clear is actually a liability of platforms. It has to be weighed against the benefits it provides them. Um, we've always found that, that platforms typically at the time have you know, amassed huge amounts of data in data centers and they've amassed it as clear text. And they've amassed it because that is the data they needed to run their functions of access and legibility. That The fact they had that data made them targets, particularly for states, who the first two uh, examples both largely require access to free text data, not completely, but the first one in particular, surveillance regimes as such, it requires access to clear text, and that's made them targets. But that target itself is a liability. Uh, you know, the Snowden revelations caused heavy reputational damage. These cause heavy costs, particularly if every country in the world wants platforms to act in this way. They have to engage bilaterally with all these countries, um, uh, and, and so it's a challenge there. And so one thing that I think we see with pets is that platforms like the idea of getting rid of clear text. Very little of what they do to make money requires clear text intrinsically. It can be achieved otherwise uh, through a variety of other strategies that, we'll, that I'll, I'll, I'll look through. 
So if you can get rid of clear text and still operate in exactly the same way as you were doing as a platform, then why not do it? It's uh, you know, like Odysseus here, tying himself to the mast, states are shouting, we want this data, we want this data, but he's got his hands tied, he can't actually provide this data. Although Odysseus sort of liked to hear the song, so I'm not sure platforms like to hear the uh, like to hear warrants without being able to do anything about them. Maybe, maybe they do. Apple, I think, does. They get PR out of it. Um, uh, so uh, I'm just, I'm just I've been the, I realize I haven't got the chat open right now, so um, I can just open that and see if there's anyone who's is writing. I can't even find it anymore. Oh, maybe it's done. Sorry. I just wanted to kind of get it open at the same time so I can, I can see if people are writing, but it appears to have totally vanished. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Nobody was was right cool. so yeah far. yeah yeah it's fine it's just let me know and i just don't know if it's zoom. Oh, sure, it's, oh, sure. it's, behind, it's behind the other window it's fine i found it it's yeah. just zoom windowing is very strange i just want to put it down <laughs> here okay cool um sorry about that um so you know, want to point to, to many of you will have read this philip rogaway's paper uh, the moral character of cryptographic work that if, if platforms choose to get rid of clear text we mustn't assume it always benefits end users because effectively we have assumed that cryptography benefits the weak because it provides them with something a state, you know, even a state can't decrypt. Um, and the ability to do that, a hugely asymmetrical computational ability, but cryptographic primitives have to be embedded into systems and these systems can realize arrangements of power that don't trivially flow from the tool. So obvious examples are DRM, you know, locking you out of things that you actually have the right to, to edit and, and, and uh, or, or, you know, or, or um, you know, software that you you purchased and now you're not able to do all the things with that you might want to so these kind of technologies configure power and similarly pets can configure power too we have to be aware of so to, to illustrate this i wanted to to help us imagine a coercive cryptographic platform with all of its bells and whistles let's imagine that a proprietary sensor-filled device, you know, like an iPhone, or especially like new, uh, new, newer devices with um, ultra wideband or something like this as well, you know, store all sense data. They're gathering it all the time. They're storing it all locally. They're storing browsing history. They're storing your pulse. It's storing all sorts of data, you know, private messages, all locally on device. Uh, and this seems to be in line with ideas of personal data stores, which are also very popular as, um, as, as kind of notions of, of what our future internet might want to look like. So let's imagine we've got this kind of system. Um, and this system is using data in a federated way to train local models of your behavior or to be able to run distributed queries over all this data with some confidentiality guarantees uh, that, that are, are nice that apply to those processes. And these devices then are delivering the requests of advertisers or people wishing for information about communities, societies, anything that's not individual data that doesn't just relate to a single individual. So you can again, put your, your favorite privacy guarantees on these. Um, uh, and if you don't comply with this, if, for example, the software, the hardware isn't so locked down that you can't say no, these uh, you know, obeying these protocols, be, getting involved in these protocols in order to, to show this data could be proved through zero knowledge systems, through, through trusted hardware and so on. And if you're not complying, then you might also lose access to benefits like cloud services or, or other, other services provided by that platform. So even if the hardware you have options in and it's not completely lo locked out, uh, you can't completely say, uh, you, you can say yes to protocol. Sometimes there might be social or economic reasons why you might want to participate in these protocols. So I think in this case, this is a, a, just an imaginary of a coercive platform, but it's not really a fiction. So we already see bits and pieces of this emerging in infrastructure today. So Google's federated learning of cohorts in their privacy sandbox is looking to use Chrome for local targeting of this kind. Google and MasterCard in their private set uh, aggregation, uh, not intersection, sorry, private set aggregation um, here is also looking at building in analytics to ad tech over data by saying we can combine new data sets while they're private, but for purposes of targeting and advertising and understanding that better. We find many companies working on targeting within end to end encrypted messaging uh, ecosystems. We find system, you know, companies working on aggregate data from telemetry. So you know, obviously the the sort of differential privacy work in both Apple and Google that can only run at you know, billions of users scale is an example of this. And we also find the constant insulation of new distributed and pretty intimate sensing infrastructures that have quite strong compute at the edge into individuals' houses 
uh, you know, smart speakers, Amazon Ring, that, that have the option for, uh, uh, you know, for edge computing. And these things are setting up, you know, also the other thing I wanted to mention, we also find obviously a lot of uh, machine learning chips being embedded into modern smartphones for local processing and edge computing, largely for running Snapchat filters at the moment, but maybe it will become, uh, you know, we find the hardware setup emerging there too. So these building blocks can obviously be used in many different ways, but a coercive approach to them is a possibility. And assumptions that we typically find in the privacy enhancing technologies literature fail in a platform world, the one that we live in. You know, we might assume, and I think there is an assumption when I read PETS literature, that if you don't like being involved in a protocol, any one actor can just say no to being involved in that protocol. It's never really laid out. It's just there. It's just the assumption is, you know, you know, all of these cryptographic actors need to cooperate, need to say yes. And if anyone has a reason that they would you know, suffer detriment from being involved, they just wouldn't get involved in this protocol. That's not the case here. Platforms control the endpoints. You know, Chrome, Google, you know, Google controls Chrome. By extension, Google effectively controls web standards by being the majority player in everywhere apart from Armenia, I found out the other day, where Firefox is the highest. So if anyone can explain that to me. Someone said it might be about Armenian fonts and Chrome failed heavily with Armenian fonts, but... <laughs> I haven't found a reason for this. So, but uh, you know, Chrome, by being the majority player, can go around W3C, also control the standards here of this process. So we find they can heavily control the endpoints. Of course, websites with huge amounts of tracking code embedded in through SDKs and apps as well. This can be altered. Even the Information Commissioner's Office's website was mining cryptocurrency a couple of years ago on people's browsers. So you know, we find that, that this is a, you're heavily able to be repurposed when you control this these SDKs. I mean, Start, start with Google Fonts for one you know, example of, of code littered all over the web. Uh, operating systems, of course, we know a lot about, about those, but we also find that things like Mac OS are closing down over time, trying to stop you easily running third party software, uh, needing it to be uh, effectively uh, signed by Apple. Otherwise, they'll try and give you so many warnings that the average consumer won't know to get around how to get around them. Then you, or literally, it's called Gatekeeper, they knew their technology here. so. They uh, decided to just, just, to, just to name it what it is. Um, and proprietary hardware, of course, and connected objects where there's not really any visibility of the code that's running or the operating system that's running, or even you know, when there's no screen, even when and how it updates. You know, I don't know if there's a, you know, a lot of connected uh, home devices are likely just updating regularly, which is you know, an important thing for security, but can also go in anyway. So PETS researchers here, have to consider, I think, the inability to opt out of protocols in, des in their design. And when, when PETS research is, um, and similar research in information security is, uh, is talking about these systems, I think there is a need to consider the broader political economy of the internet today and think about, well, is this protocol, uh, you know, does, it, does it automatically show visibility? Does it allow people to have accountability, uh, perhaps? And this is where um, we might want to think about the fact that some functions, why would we want to opt out? Well, some functions or aggregate information may be dangerous here. So you know, F of A, B and C uh, could be anything in this diagram. And some things it's you know, going to be pretty easy, you know, who's the millionaire? Um, but, uh, but in other situations, you know, let's, use, uh, let's use some kind of distributed computing to find out the location of hidden LGBT or political gathering venues from location data that's held locally in an oppressive state. If you have an ability to ask infrastructure questions like this, then that aggregate data is of course really, really sensitive. And you know, then you can go and raid an LGBT bar. This is aggregate data can be coercive too. And we mustn't forget that it's not just personal data or, or data that relates to individuals that provides power that can, that can change people's lives. So I would say this, this demands that PETS researchers also need to design somehow for accountability. We typically only think about the privacy properties of outputs and think about information leakage and so on, but these are qualitative questions that relate more to research ethics. So we have research ethics boards, what can and can't be asked. And it's why the Facebook emotional contagion experiment caused so much problem with people and resonated so much as a, as a sort of war story of the algorithmic age because the Facebook emotional contagion experiment was a breach of research ethics. It's something that we might that might not have been passed in a, in a, through a university uh, setup. Uh, and platforms aren't really covered by research ethics in, in that way. And so if we focus on privacy as confidentiality, we don't stop and say which questions can and can't we ask. So that's another aspect I want to put in. 
Um, and a third aspect which relates to both of these is the legitimacy of systems more broadly. And I wanted to just use the recent example of exposure notification from Apple and Google here, where you know, we know that platforms restrict the space of deployable protocols. And this was obviously highlighted. It was not news to many people who are scholars in this space, like many people in this digital room. But you know, um, uh, when I was involved in the DP3T consortium that, that created the TP3T system, which many people probably are familiar with the workings of, um, but you know, no, no contact tracing system was really deployable well on iOS without, you know, without really using loopholes that could be closed at any time or heavily using battery until a software update was provided from Apple. And in the end, Apple chose to only facilitate decentralized systems and not provide the building blocks that facilitate centralized proximity tracing protocols. And this, you know, this uh, led to the adoption of exposure notification in some countries and other countries, some countries were already going for those kind of systems, some countries weren't, but of course it was a pivotal factor. But this asks questions about the legitimacy of um, who decides which protocols can and can't run. And of course, this is not just a case of public health, which is one example, but it's also who decides which protocols might be threatening to Apple and Google's business, might compete with them in certain spaces, you know, might do something they want to do later on. And we saw you know, Bluetooth beacons, for example, in shops. Of course, they were locked down um, ostensibly for privacy reasons, um, uh, and no one really uses them too much anyway. They sort of died a bit of a death. Um, uh, but we also see that Apple you know, have the, their uh, own iBeacon system and Google have their own Eddystone system. You know, they, they locked out competitors as well as ostensibly saying they are preventing this for privacy, as well as providing a, you know, a solution for marketers that they're selling. So this is a, a, you know, an issue for power and competition in markets as well. So I'm in the law faculty, um, and so you might be asking, what about what about the law? Um, and there's a few uh, aspects of the law that are relevant here, including I'm going to uh, follow up with uh, Paddy Lisson, who's also, I think, in this room, and say I'm going to do a bit of an overview of some of the aspects of the law that was only published on Tuesday, uh, the Digital Markets Act, which is relevant to this discussion. But firstly, let's look at data protection. Data protection law, um, it's important to know data protection is not the same as confidentiality. It doesn't map exactly. Um, when we think of, of privacy, we typically in computation terms think of information leakage or, or, inf or other metrics that relate to that. And people think about GDPR as a motivator for PETS research. But data protection is about rights and obligations. It doesn't have the very adversarial approach of, of um, information security where you are very suspicious of, of uh, other actors or potential attackers. Uh, data protection, um, as illustrated well in a paper by Claudia Diaz um, uh, and colleagues, uh, Omar Tene and Seda Gerses, uh, called uh, Hero or Villain, the Data Controller in Data Protection Law, it's worth reading. Um, data protection tends to trust or try to uh, make, them, make other parties trustworthy. And it does so through providing obligations too, like the right to access data, object to its use in certain ways or to erase it, and the obligation to be accountable, and importantly, to process data fairly. This is a really broad use of the term, not just about discrimination and bias, but in a way to reduce asymmetries between data subjects and data controllers. It's not just about confidentiality, and indeed, privacy by design is not a requirement of data protection law. Data protection by design is, saying that you build in the rights and obligations more holistically from data protection law. So it's not the case that it's always going to be that if you design a system that has no information leakage, it's going to be in line with data protection law. So there are tools we can use here to say, well, this isn't fair. It might be confidential, but this is not fair processing. And under European law, the Court of Justice has also held on several occasions that you can be a data controller and therefore fall within the GDPR's scope without seeing clear text personal data at all. And it's three separate cases that say this now. So the data controller definition is uh, an entity that determines the means and purposes of data processing. And you know, someone orchestrating a protocol that doesn't see any clear text data is clearly determining the means and purposes of processing of that data, which is happening on people's devices. So data protection law does have a hook in, even if you make a system fully confidential for, an ind for individual data, it has a hook. Um, but is that hook effective? Arguably not, because when you read through the GDPR, a lot of the obligations of a data controller sort of assume that you have access to the data or that you could have access. 
you know, to provide access, to provide erasure, provide objection, or to 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 you know, change um, a transparency over processing, or to check fairness, for example. So these obligations do implicitly assume that you have access to clear text data. And so there's a challenge there with data protection law. There's a tension that has to be resolved and it's not an easy one, um, but we're gonna see that clash in the future. So hook, but it's not gonna get us out of this completely. We also have the e-privacy directive. This is uh, known as the cookie law to most people here, I think. Uh, and the cookie law is, um, is uh, it really, it, it harks back the history of this, um, these provisions. Um, uh, to um, to copyright in many ways. So you know, people might remember that you know there was a period where if you bought a CD or DVD uh, and you put it in your PC, it literally just would try and install a rootkit and try and <laughs> try and like install software and it would, it'd be like, what is going on here? Like you just would like mm, it has to go in a hi-fi. It can't. I can't risk any extra features that have been added to the CD or DVD. Um, uh, and, and that was really problematic because a lot of these uh, very early um, uh, these early um, uh, software kits that were uh, embedded in CDs were designed to stop you pirating it and designed to really do nasty things to your computer um, to uh, to control copyright. And it was partially because of this that the e-privacy directive was um, enacted and strengthened to require consent where you access or store information on a terminal device where um, it, as long as that access and storage isn't required, strictly required to provide a service. And this isn't personal data, this is any information. So this is why cookies come into it in general. It's not just personal data here. Access and storing information, like superfluous information from someone's device requires consent under European law. Um, and, and so cookies are fine. If a cookie's for a login cookie or a shopping basket cookie, you don't need to have consent. But when cookies are doing things above and beyond what's actually required to provide a website uh, in, a, in a safe and secure manner, then that's where you see cookie banners and cookie pop-ups. So look at Privacy International's website, they lay cookies for things like login, but they don't need a cookie banner. And they, they can note that happily. You know, so, so you know, that's, um, uh, that's the context of the law. So this law might also be able to kick in to stop extraneous protocols running because these are accessing and storing data on a terminal device, even if it's you know, uh, data that's, that's, uh, you know, that's ciphertext from another person's device or in an NPC calculation, you know, there might still be storage of data. But it depends how granular the law sees a data storage and processing operation. If you tick yes to begin with when you install the app, it's not much help if a protocol starts running three weeks later trying to do something different. So the law and regulators would need to see it in a granular way, but that in turn can end up fatiguing users. So we can see that turning into a click yes, click accept, or just annoying people. And indeed, the many things were added to e-privacy law to deliberately try and annoy users to make, you know, this was the industry lobby. But the idea is we want to stop European privacy law. We will add and lobby four pieces that deliberately make it so frustrating that users will not like it and then want the whole law rolled back. That's been a, a lobby strategy for many years. Um, and note as well that consent also needs to be able to be rejected. In a recent study that I did with colleagues at Aarhus University and MIT, we found that only 11.8% of of kind of cookie pop-ups, even allow, um, uh, even a minimally legal, including allowing things like rejecting or, or not accepting, strolling as consent or something like this. So this is, you know, has a promise here, but again, consent isn't always the solution in this situation, I think. Uh, and uh, it's, it's handy for super users, um, but we haven't seen enforcement in this area either. So this can be a kind of pie in the sky that it will fix it. So the last legislation that I want to talk about is the Digital Markets Act, which some of you might have seen popping up through on Twitter, uh, because the Digital Markets Act was proposed with its, um, its sort of sister proposal, the Digital Services Act, on Tuesday by the European Commission, by um, uh, Vestaya and, uh, Thier and Thierry Breton, um, who are commissioners that sort of slightly at each other's, uh, at each other's throats a bit. Uh, but the Digital Markets Act kind of took a few people by surprise uh, because it was some other instruments previously and it's been sort of rejigged into this. Many people were focusing on this other Digital Services Act, which is a bit in some ways like the UK's online harm proposals. It falls in a similar vein. Whereas this is more of a, a supporting um, piece of legislation uh, that, that sits alongside competition law and aims to tackle some of those same concerns. Um, and it's still an early proposal, but some things in it are going to be quite controversial. And let's look through them. So the structure of the Digital Markets Act 
again, this is all a proposal, none of this is actually law yet, and it probably won't be for some years, if at all. Um, it defines core platform services to begin with, and here's a list of them. And these are the kind of, we know when we see it, these platforms, here, here they are. They're not all platforms, they're intermediaries of different types. So intermediation services, that's capturing your Uber and Airbnb and these kind of services, search engine, social networks, operating systems as well, note that's in there, um, ad networks. And any provider of these that's, that's large and powerful um, is considered to be a gatekeeper and there's conditions for that um, and, and ways of, of identifying gatekeepers that are emerging or new and so on. When you're a gatekeeper and a provider of one or more core platform services, you're subject to provisions in articles five and six. I'm not going to go through these articles in detail. I'm going to pull out in layman's terms what some of these, uh, what some of these uh, provisions are. So firstly, I mentioned that contractual coercion is problematic. If you're saying, hey, we can run whatever protocol we want, you might be making running that protocol conditional. Uh, uh, you might be making services conditional on running that protocol. And so that's a tie that the Digital Markets Act might help to prevent, particularly for business customers. So it says things like it tackles exclusivity contracts. You can't write contracts that say you can't be a driver for Uber and Lyft at the same time. It stops business users paying businesses outside the platform and using a platform to uh, to uh, to, pro to provide that service. That's like the Apple tax for for transactions. You know, the thirty percent on any subscription or transaction that Apple tries to get and tries to force platforms and app apps rather to only get people to pay through that Apple Pay process. Um, and you can't stop business users of platforms snitching on them to law enforcement, which is also handy. So there are some rules that prevent this kind of contractual coercion that we see. And they also link to, uh, which isn't really mentioned much in this act, consumer protection law as well. So there's also exist in unfair terms and so on that we might find. We also find in this act, there are data provisions. So you can't, if you're a, if you're a gatekeeper, you're not allowed to combine data from a core platform service with another service you run without consent of the user. So that's the idea of you can't you can't uh, you say I'm going to combine a um, uh, search and YouTube data together because that gives a lot of power in a market unless a user has actually consented to that happening. Just because you run two or more core services, it's trying to dilute your power from that. It also directly tackles things like Chrome, which has been signing users into uh, other services of the gatekeeper using the browser without consent. So. It actually has wording that would try and ban that practice. It's also got provisions such as portability, allowing uh, effective continuous and real-time data portability. Um, and this is the idea that you might have an account on Facebook, you have to retain that account, but you could maybe be going on Macedon or Twitter or something and porting your data in real time from one to the other. You're still then subject to Facebook's profiling, but a bit challenging there. So there is a question on the chat. Oh, um, yeah, I'll re read it out. Uh, John asks, mm -hmm. so what would symmetry of power by design look like? Um, I'm not sure where you're seeing. John, do you want to explain that a bit, what you're asking? Uh, let's leave it to the end. <laughs> cool, cool. I'm almost at the end anyway. Um, it sounds like an interesting question. I would be good to dig into it more. Um, so yeah, data portability is there, but we might also think that this real-time data portability might actually allow coercion. You know, it might allow people to engage in protocols to collect more and more data onto their local device um, and then, then have protocols that run on it. So there are two sides to this coin, which are good and bad. And again, nothing wrong with having a lot of data on your device that, that relates to you. I think that's quite cool. What happens to it you know, should also be uh, legitimate and relating to your decisions or your wishes, at least maybe not individual decisions. So this is now where it gets really juicy and where I think the information security community might get pretty interested. So the uh, operating system provisions that, that are in these. So you've got to allow users to uninstall pre-installed software unless it's technically necessary for the functioning of the operating system or device, and it can't be offered on a standalone basis by third parties. So what is technically necessary? Is that like Google Play services? Can we remove that and take that out? You know, are there, how far down an OS are we identifying different pieces of software? Is a protocol running in the operating system layer like exposure notification considered to be a piece of software? Uh, or is it something higher up that we see as an app? And I'm not sure the legislature has really dealt with this more, but indeed this, is, this can be expanded by further law. That's the idea of this provision. So I think they might be thinking about apps like Maps and Google Mail, but 
if we were to say software can also be APIs, and these APIs that are embedded in operating systems look more and more like apps themselves and are, and are you know, embedded in the preferencing pa preferences panes and they work very similarly to apps. So, um, so where's, the, where's the, 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 the delineation there? Um, they also, uh, uh, are meant th th these gatekeepers also are meant to allow effective installation and use of third-party software and third-party app stores. So uh, this is the idea that Apple has to lose its monopoly on having the Apple App Store and can, to allow sideloading of software because they must allow software to be installed without using the core service. So without using the operating system sort of App Store built in directly, you must be able to load it from elsewhere. That seems to be the intention of this provision. But they can take proportionate measures to ensure the integrity of their hardware operating system. So I can't imagine Apple's gonna be particularly happy with wanting a third party App Store. And it's gonna be unclear to which APIs in the operating system they are allowed to access or not. You know, uh, how that plays with App Store guidelines and soft law rules. And that also then relates to ideas of, you know, if you had a third party App Store, could it be full of coercive applications? Would the Apple App Store be designed to prevent that? Would you have a you know, privacy friendly app store somewhere else? Would you have an app store which is designed to, to, you know, to allow employers to install spyware on people's devices? You know, the, like, these kind of relationships become very interesting thinking about the interaction between this security but also the social side of security and coercion too. And there's also a last provision around device neutrality relates to the open internet and net neutrality. This is uh, seemingly designed to, to prevent uh, kind of the next level of zero rating or the next level of net neutrality breaches where you might bundle a phone to a particular operating system provider and lock it, you know, like SIM locking, or lock it to being only being able to use data in a certain way or being able to use certain um, DNS providers or something like this. So the idea of going beyond internet access providers have net neutrality obligations to think about device neutrality and, um, and uh, and what the device, particularly in vertically integrated ecosystems, is telling you to do, you know, if Google starts to run a mobile service with um, or, or the like. So I think it's my last slide. Where does this leave us? Well, if these provisions were uh, actually come into law, and, and I see a question in the, I'll just tackle with this in the chat from Gerald Buckley, that um, you know, the GDPR was proposed in 2012, came into law in 2016, came into force effectively was enforceable in um, 2018. Uh, and now we now have the most recent fines, uh, the only first fine from Ireland against Twitter, a measly fine for a data breach of 450,000 euros is just this week. So we see that whole process, that's been a sort of nine year process from commission proposal to first fine, as Chris Marsden pointed out on Twitter today. Um, and so maybe this will be this length, um, and the Digital Markets Act is a very contentious act and will be lobbied very heavily and resisted very heavily. So um, that could be a length of uh, timeline to becoming law for the sort of 2012, 2016, four years to become law. If, you, if they want to beat GDPR's record, they could. Um, it's not gonna become law next year. I very, very, very much doubt that. Um, so less power for operating systems as a gatekeeper. Um, the soft law ability of app store rules to, to prevent this, uh, you know, uh, that Facebook is getting very annoyed at right now because it's providing limits on SDKs and requiring consent to embedded SDKs inside apps, that might disappear. You might have the Digital Markets Act provide less ability to penalize users for not running protocols, at least maybe gig economy users and business users. Um, but you've got big questions for system design, security and operating systems that are going to be unresolved and are going to be sticking points here. You've got potential new avenues for conditionality of third-party software without using an app store. You know, you actually ways to get pretty nasty software on people's devices that we have to deal with. So I expect platforms to double down on actually using pets here. This is where it kind of links back to the beginning of the talk to create privacy and security reasons not to adhere to the DMA. I expect that they will say, if we were to do this, it would break privacy. If we were to do this, it would break security and start to pitch off cybersecurity laws and data protection laws against competition, power and market laws meant to restrain that to try and create a tension that can't be resolved. And so pets researchers need to engage with this. Can we have pets that also distribute and decentralize power from really large platforms? The ad tech industry, the sort of real time bidding ad tech industry is really trying to go at Google right now for trying to abolish third party cookies and do things in their browser. 
Um, and it's a danger because on one hand, that's a quite nice proposal because it's good for privacy and confidentiality, centralizes power, and they have a point, you know, that, that this is Google's power play move to kick out other people from the market, as well as a move for privacy and, 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 uh, and similar. How do we reconcile that? And can we think of research that might actually, you know, prevent monopoly control over Chrome being the only way to target ads uh, and allow other actors to get involved in that ecosystem without compromising on confidentiality or, or privacy and security? I think that's a real important call for research, because if we don't, then it's going to be a rock and a hard place and there's going to be explosions and sparks in, in, in pets and similar. So that's uh, my talk. So thanks a lot for, uh, for having me here and happy to, to let's open up for questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Michael, for this nice food, food for thought. Uh, I'll stop the recording and then we'll go over to the Q&A session.